afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Diana Conway. I'm president of the Montgomery County Women's Democratic Club. Thank you for joining us. We have a terrific event for you today. We're excited to welcome a longtime local resident and a man of many hats, Tom Perez. Before we begin our program, I'd like to make a few quick announcements. First, a uh, word about WDC. Um, we are all about getting organized and getting results. And we do this by keeping you, our members and our community informed on key issues affecting women and their families, and then enabling you to take action through us and through our sister organizations. Our core mission is around promoting democratic policies and electing democratic candidates, and then holding them accountable for pursuing our priority agenda items once they are elected. At each of these events, you've heard me ask you to join or renew your membership um, in the Women's Democratic Club. We are your club and your membership empowers us and makes our voice relevant when we meet with our elected officials and our policymakers, from school resource officers to healthcare access to police accountability. You are what gives WDC credibility when we speak to these elected and appointed officials. So please consider joining or renewing. Um, the link is at the bottom uh, in the chat at the bottom of your screen. And your voice also gives you a vote in our um, WDC leadership elections. Our annual meeting is scheduled tentatively for late June. More on that when we get the date nailed down. Um, and of course, in addition to your membership, we'd really love to have your time and your talents. We are always on the hunt for people to help out in whatever way suits you, um, whether familiar area of expertise or in a role that offers you um, growth and learning opportunities. We need you for our website. We need you for our advocacy committee uh, and its many issue area subcommittees, treasurer or speakers like today's. So look over our committees and make it fun for yourself. Bring a friend with you to do this work in your chosen area. And we always want your suggestions on how to do this work uh, better, suggested speakers. Um, let us know how we're doing. Our website has a whole lot of community items that we list, um, including the Democratic Breakfast Clubs who are busy hosting elected officials and wannabe elected officials, uh, Leisure World, the Montgomery County Democratic Central Committee, um, and they will take your burning questions uh, in a public forum. So before we move to today's program with Tom Perez, just a word about our um, just concluded, uh, excuse me, our next event is um, Fiona Hill, who you probably remember from the Ukraine hearings uh, during the first impeachment. And I know you remember that. She burst onto the scene with an amazing accent and a very clear-eyed view of the White House behavior and extortion relating to Ukraine. Um, so I hope you'll save the date, the 29th at one, and th that registration is already open on our website. I think it'll be in the chat below um, or womensdemocraticclub.org. Um, so just concluded uh, state legislative session. I'm happy to say, I'm proud to say WDC really made a difference in this year's session. Together with over 400 members of our grassroots advocacy team, we really worked the issues most relevant to women and their families for the county and across the state with our elected officials and our sister activist organizations. These new laws will bring Maryland into the national forefront of police reform and juvenile criminal justice, tackle drug prices, protect families from excessive medical debt and create a targeted child tax credit. Um, they also address the challenges of parenting students. They usher in a new age of telehealth medicine, and we overrode the veto of the Blueprint for Maryland's Future, passed needed modifications, and by no mean last or least, repeal of our racist state song, uh, with special hats off to longtime WDC member and board member, Ginger McComer, and my predecessor, Fran Rothstein, for that final push over the line. Um, it wasn't all rosy. We did have some disappointments that we will focus on going forward. There's still more to do and a lot of important bills that slipped away in the final hours, including sweeping climate change legislation, reversing the marital defense law to um, sexual assault, more eviction help for tenants, um, just to mention a few. So we will have a more comprehensive legislative write-up um, from our advocacy committee. Just keep an eye out for that. And... Um, 
Final reminders, um, everyone is going to be muted. Please do stay on mute, but we want your questions. So if you go to the bottom of your screen, uh, there's a chat box, click on that and then navigate to Q&A and enter your question there. We will leave the chat open for people to chat, um, but if you want the questions posed, please do send them directly to Q&A. It's hard for us to, uh, to watch both of those. And today's program is being recorded. I think you had to click through a consent button there, but we're all about consent. So I think I have not seen, oh, hang on, I'm sorry. I do see some elected officials here. Thank you for joining us. Tom Hucker from District 5 on our County Council. Uh, Joan Kleiman representing Senator Van Hollen. Uh, Marcy Frosch representing our Attorney General, Brian Frosch. And Lori Ann Sales, former WDC board member and a county, a, city council member from the city um, of Gaithersburg. So thank you all. We know you've got a lot going on, uh, a lot on your plate. So we're glad to have you in part of this conversation. Um, now on to today's program, Tom Perez, recent chair of the Democratic National Committee. You may have noticed we took back the White House and the Senate under his watch. Uh, Tom is a lifelong public servant. Um, he led the transformation of the Democratic National Committee and um, has agreed that more remains to be done as always. For example, he would like to see New Hampshire and Iowa bumped from their first in the nation status in the presidential nominating process to reflect current opportunities. As Obama's assistant attorney general for civil rights, he led the Justice Department's voting rights and police reform work. And here in Maryland, Tom served as Secretary of Labor, Licensing and Regulation under Governor O'Malley and was the first Latino elected to the Montgomery County Council. Tom served almost a decade on the board of CASA, including a stint as board chair and is currently considering a, a run for governor. Um, Tom is a son of immigrants from the Dominican Republic. He grew up in Buffalo and put himself through college, earning tuition money on the back of a garbage truck. He earned his bachelor's degree from Brown University, a master's of public policy from Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, and a Harvard Law degree. He lives in Tacoma Park with his wife, Anne-Marie Stoudenmire, an attorney with the Washington Legal Clinic for the Homeless, and their three children. So, Tom, um, the floor is yours. Thank you for making time to join us, and i um, delighted to have you back in civilian life, at least um, for a while. <laughs> Diana, thanks for that kind introduction. And thank you to all uh, the officers of the Women's Democratic Club. Great to be back with you. And I, I wanna start out by uh, thanking you. Uh, the work you've done over the last four years, we had to take our democracy back. Four years ago, our democracy was on fire and it was a five alarm blaze. We didn't have the White House, we didn't have the Senate, we didn't have the House. We had 16 governors that were Democrats. We only had 16 or 17 governors that were attorneys general or attorney, state attorneys general. Uh, we were in a ditch and we had to climb out. And your work was indispensable in our success. Whether you were working here in Maryland, whether you were going down to North Carolina, you know, four years ago in Virginia, there were 66 Republicans in the Virginia House of Delegates uh, and 34 Democrats. Now there are 55 Democrats and 45 Republicans uh, because of a team effort uh, involving everyone. And we have the state Senate there. We've got a, a Democratic governor. We're going to keep it that way. All of this work was because of you. And every time I think about the American Rescue Plan, I can't help but think about Georgia. You know, we had to work overtime after November because we had 48 Democrats and 50 uh, Republicans in the Senate. And we had to run the table in Georgia, and you all were there for that as well. Um, I am proud of what we accomplished at the DNC. I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions about what we did there, but I am so grateful because I know that success is always a team effort, and you were indispensable parts of that team. Uh, and that Georgia was a cliffhanger, but because of the work you did, we were able to move forward. And because of that work, the arc of history is going to be so different. The American Rescue Plan would not have happened if we had not won those two Senate seats in Georgia, plainly and simply. Uh, it has enabled Joe Biden to keep these promises of building back better across America. And you look at the American Rescue Plan, I am hard pressed, putting aside perhaps the Affordable Care Act, 
I am hard pressed to see a more impactful piece of legislation in the last 20 years than this stimulus bill that passed. Look what it does just for Maryland alone. $6.25 billion in checks going to 2.5 million Maryland residents, expanding the child care tax credit, expanding unemployment benefits, making sure that we lift 52,000 Maryland children out of poverty, 1.1 million children in Maryland. That's, that's roughly 85% of Maryland's children uh, benefiting from this. 300,000 Marylanders relying on unemployment insurance benefits, and uh, they are going to get those extended benefits. Almost $2 billion for K-12 education. If you talk to anybody in local government across the state, and I've been having a lot of conversations with county executives and county council members, and with delegates and senators in Annapolis, uh, this bill has been a godsend because the state of Maryland got almost $4 billion in direct funding. Again, you should feel great about this because you played a big role in helping us win these elections that enabled us to do this. Elections have consequences and the consequences of our success have been really, really important. We're getting shots in people's arms, we're getting checks in people's bank accounts and we're putting people back to work. Every Thursday, I'm a little geeky. First thing I do is I look at the first time claims for unemployment benefits to see the trend data. We had the lowest number of claims since the pandemic uh, began today. The economy is absolutely moving in the right direction and we've got more work to do. There's no doubt about it. And the next frontier is really infrastructure. And I wanna talk a little bit about uh, that infrastructure because it's more than the infrastructure you might have in mind when you first think about infrastructure. Yes, there's going to be dramatic investments in roads and bridges and other things, but infrastructure also enables us to tackle a lot of our climate change challenges. Uh, the president is committed to making sure, and as someone who drives an electric vehicle, and uh, I oftentimes have uh, uh, range anxiety because of the absence of uh, charging stations, that's part of the infrastructure bill. Uh, massive investments in, um, in electrical um, infrastructure so that we will be able uh, to expand our electric fleets across this country. But it's not only um, physical infrastructure, it's broadband infrastructure. I was speaking to somebody in Salisbury about a week ago, and she was telling me the story of uh, children who have been getting in the cars of their parents each day, and they drive around Salisbury uh, to find um, a business where they can park outside that business and try to access their internet so that their kids can go to school on Zoom in the car. That's just not who we are as a nation. We can do so much better than that. And this infrastructure bill will be investing in broadband. We must also invest in our child care and our elder care infrastructure. If you look at this unemployment pandemic that we had, women took it on the chin. Why? Because women are the caregivers. So many women had to leave the workforce uh, as a result of this pandemic. We must build a child care infrastructure. We must build an elder care infrastructure. And this infrastructure bill will enable us to do that. But there's another dimension of infrastructure, and that's reflected in HR1, the infrastructure of democracy. We have just gotten through the most dangerous presidency in American history. This president, this, the former president, had no regard for the rule of law, no regard for the Constitution. His North Star was himself and his family, and he got impeached not once but twice. The insurrection that he fomented um, was literally deadly. And we must restore the infrastructure of democracy. And that's why I applaud Jamie Raskin and, and J.P. Sarbanes and others who are leading the effort on HR1. 10 years ago, I was the head of the Civil Rights Division. I often say in voting work, the most important year in voting rights is the year that ends with a one. Always remember that. Why is that? Because that's the year after we do the census. That's the year of redistricting. And that's often the year of a lot of shenanigans. In 2011, we had an important tool 
that could serve as a backstop against a lot of voter shenanigans. And that was the Voting Rights Act, in particular, sections four and five of the Voting Rights Act. And what they said in a nutshell, what those provisions said was certain states and localities that had a history of voting discrimination had to get any change. And when I say any change, moving a polling place was a change. They had to get it pre-cleared either at the Justice Department or in front of a three judge panel. That was critically important. And we used section five aggressively to stop um, uh, voter ID laws in uh, Texas and South Carolina and elsewhere, redistricting plans that were designed to make it harder for black and brown people to exercise the franchise. Uh, we used it hundreds of times during this period. Well, unfortunately in 2013, the Supreme Court neutered section five and section four of the Voting Rights Act. They effectively declared in an opinion that still baffles me that uh, discrimination is a thing of the past. Times have changed and uh, we shouldn't have these straight jackets on these states and localities. And guess what happened right after that? Not surprisingly, you saw the shenanigans all over the country. Look what's just happened in Georgia. Um, the law that was passed there, if you pass out a bottle of water to someone waiting in line, you can be charged with a, a, an offense punishable by a year in jail. And, and the thing that is so dangerous about these laws, and there's over 300 of them being proposed around the country, the things that's so dangerous about them is they are built on a foundation of fiction. The reason they're passing the law in Georgia, they say is, well, we have doubts about the election. It was a clean election. Even the Republican Secretary of State and the Republican governor acknowledged this. I'm a firm believer that we should make it as easy as possible for eligible people to vote. We should have a robust debate in the marketplace of ideas about all of the issues of the moment and then make it easy for eligible people to vote, not hard. And it was miraculous in 2020, record turnout, remarkable turnout because states made it easier for eligible people to vote. But you know what? The other side doesn't wanna make it easier for people to vote. They believe, and they've believed this for decades, that their leverage in elections goes up as the voting populace goes down. And in particular, their leverage in elections goes up as they suppress black and brown and other voters of color. I was a plaintiff in the Arizona case that just got argued before the Supreme Court. To understand that case, and I'll give you a 60 second version, you gotta understand the Navajo Nation. The Navajo Nation in Arizona is larger than the state of West Virginia. Some people have to travel two hours to get to a mailbox. Two hours to get to a mailbox. And so Arizona previously had a law that allowed you to hand your ballot to somebody and then they can turn it in. But the legislature after section five was overturned because we told them that law wouldn't pass muster. But after they got a permission slip when section five was neutered, they passed a law making it a crime for someone to carry your ballot. It was directly designed to make it harder for people in Indian country to vote. Shame on them. And the, the Ninth Circuit found that it was intentional discrimination. That's what we're up against, folks. And that is why when you think about infrastructure, we've got to continue to think about every element of infrastructure, our physical infrastructure, our human capital infrastructure, our environmental infrastructure, and our political infrastructure. There has never been greater threats to the right to vote than what we are seeing now. And that is why we must be vigilant. And frankly, in my opinion, if necessary, we must do filibuster reform in order to make sure we pass voting rights legislation. Because I don't trust the Supreme Court to be a backstop, not for a moment. And that is why this moment is so perilous. But I'll tell you, I come to you, yes, with trepidation because we are at a moment of peril. But I also come to you with relentless optimism. Uh, Diana just reviewed some of the things that took place in the Maryland General Assembly session. 
it was a pretty remarkable session in the aggregate. Um, the police reform work, I spent 15 years of my life doing police misconduct cases federally. I prosecuted an LAPD officer pre-Rodney King. The work that they did in the assembly, I applaud Democrats, I applaud them, because you know what? The most important tool that a police officer has, and I learned this firsthand, is not her gun or his gun, it's, it is the trust of the people. If you don't have the trust of the community, you have nothing as a police officer. Maryland was the first state decades ago to pass a law enforcement officer's bill of rights, which basically eliminated accountability in law enforcement. And now Maryland has become the first state to repeal it. I applaud the Democrats for what they did. And I applaud Speaker Jones. I applaud uh, President Ferguson for what he did. I applaud them for what they did in the Kerwin uh, Commission, implementing this. Education is the great equalizer, my parents always taught me. And the equity lens through which the Kerwin funding formulas have passed are gonna give new opportunity. I applaud what the assembly did in the juvenile justice context. You know, we used to have a law in place, you know, if you commit a, a, a bad offense when you're 15 years old, it's to lock them up and throw away the key forever. I firmly believe that when a 15 year old does something that's bad, they ought to have hope that if they rehabilitate themselves, that someday they can be free. And now we're doing that in Maryland. But make no mistake about it, we got a lot of unfinished business. Maryland has the largest, the highest per capita incarceration rate of black men in the United States, the state of Maryland. We got more work to do. That's not right. We have more work to do in the housing setting, as Diana pointed out. We've got more work to do on climate change. But folks, there was a tremendous amount accomplished and you once again were part of it. Democracy, we have learned the hard way from 2016 can't be a spectator sport. We must all work together. And when we do that, I think the sky's the limit. And that is why, again, I, I come to you with gratitude for all you have done. You've rolled up your sleeves. Uh, you, you understood that uh, our democracy was on fire and it was a five alarm blaze. And you didn't run away from the fire, you ran toward it. And that's how we were able to win. Uh, federally. That's how we have been able to succeed in the state of Maryland. And I'm confident we can do it. This is a moment of tremendous opportunity here in Maryland and across America. And I am confident that as Democrats, we can lead the way. So thanks so much uh, for having me. And I'm really, really looking forward uh, to your questions. Well, thanks, Tom. Um, that was terrific. And I'd like to just go ahead and get right to questions. Um, before, uh, Nancy Kopp, our state treasurer, is oh, wow. here and has joined us. I wanted to say hello. Thanks for joining us. And also Kathleen Connor from Congressman Raskin's office. In fact, I was with Congressman Raskin and uh, Tom, your successor, Jamie um, Harrison. It was the Jamie and Jamie show with the Democratic State Party last night. Um, and I was encouraged to make Jamie a pitch uh, to join not only WDC, but also your state and national Democratic Party as uh, supporting members out there if you're haven't already done that. Um, so post DNC, here you are fresh, uh, four years uh, from the DNC, yes. two nice successes in the White House and the Senate. Let's feel pretty good. Um, what changes do you want to see? Why do you want to bump Iowa and New Hampshire? Um, what would you use instead? And what are the biggest to do's that you didn't get to or didn't get to finish? Um, is it something that you think Jamie Harrison is going to be able to close out? Um, let's start with that. Okay. Yeah. Oh, great question. Uh, when I got to the DNC four years ago, um, we were broken. We were bankrupt. Yeah, you know, we were seven million dollars in the hole. We had a crisis of confidence. My job was to restore, uh, our, to rebuild our infrastructure and to rebuild trust. And we set out to do both, and uh, to recommit ourselves to electing Democrats up and down the ballot, from the school board to the Oval Office. I mentioned Virginia by design because 2017, we invested a lot of time and energy in Virginia, uh, as well as New Jersey, where we won both those governor's races and uh, a ton of down ballot races. And so we continued to make those investments. 2018, flipped the house, uh, that was huge. 
Uh, and again, we were working side by side with our partners in the alphabet soup. I'm just going to go up and brush my teeth. And, um, you know, the, 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 and then what we had to do was manage a presidential process, uh, nomination process that I figured was going to have a lot of candidates. I didn't think it was going to be 25. And uh, so that was a challenge. But the thing about it was we did some things in 2018 that set the table for it. Uh, Superdelegate reform. There are still members of Congress to this day that are angry at me for this. But I thought it was really important to return power to the grassroots. Uh, and uh, we did that. And as a result of that, every single candidate uh, got a fair shake. The day before the Iowa caucus in 2016, you know, without anyone having voted, already there were hundreds of delegates that had been allocated. The day before the 2020 Iowa caucus, none of them had been allocated. And that level playing field enabled everybody to compete. And every single candidate, and I'm really proud of them, made a commitment to support with enthusiasm the winner. Mm -hmm. And that is what happened. And the lessons we learned from this cycle were that superdelegate reform, I think, was the right thing to do. We also encouraged states to move from caucuses to primaries. In 2016, there were 14 caucus states. In 2020, there were seven. We can't force the state to become a primary state. They have to pass a law. And in some states that are Republican controlled, they're not going to do that. And so we, um, we adopted a lot of the lessons from 2016. It helped us to win in 2020. And now the question, and this is part of the question that was asked, is what did I learn from 2020? I don't think, I'd, I'd like to have zero caucus states. And here's why. Caucuses have less participation. You know, when Washington State and Colorado, to take two examples, moved from caucus to primaries, um, they saw six-fold increases in turnout in their primaries, six-fold. I want more people to participate. Yeah. The other thing we have to address, and I, you know, and I, I, I got in a little trouble with a few folks for saying this, but you know, we need to have the early primaries be in places that are demographically representative of who we are as a nation and who we are as a democratic party. Iowa and New Hampshire are not representative in the year 2020 right. of right. who we are as a party and who we are as a nation. And so uh, I don't, so what we did was we set up a process just like we did in 2017, we had the Unity Reform Commission. We have another commission set up that is going to address uh, the primary and caucus issue and is going to address the order. I, I don't know what the um, result will be, but I will say with some confidence, I don't think you're going to see the order that uh, we saw in 2020 anymore. We need a more um, representative sample. We, we've been doing it this way since 1984 or something like that. The world has changed since 1984. And we need states like Nevada or elsewhere that are more demographically representative to be earlier uh, in the process. And I'm confident that the DNC will, will do that. Um, and so same question, I guess, with um, your time at Department of Justice with civil rights. What, were, what was your proudest achievement there? What did you feel like you wish you could have concluded? Yeah. And do you think that Kristen Clark can move that ball? By the way, Kristen's a star. I was yeah. tweeting about her yesterday. Yeah. Uh, you know, she worked in the division. Uh, uh, we've had her here twice. And yeah. she's I mean, been she's the whole package. Time. Like, let's, let, let's like game, set, and match. Yeah. Uh, and she knocked it out of the park yesterday. Uh, and I mean, she is the American dream. She's the embodiment of that. When I got to the Justice Department in 2009, uh, again, the Civil Rights Division was in shambles. It had been politicized terribly by the Bush administration. My predecessor had been recommended for criminal prosecution uh, by our department's inspector general. That's how bad it was. You know, people, uh, I did a lot of listening at the outset and people described, you know, terrible situation there. Uh, I remember vividly a couple people uh, saying that they felt like they had PTSD. Those are not my words, those were their words. I, I, I always had a box of Kleenex next to me when I was meeting with employees. I'm, I'm not making this up, Diana, because um, it was hard. And so our job was uh, restoration and transformation. 
Um, it's a, the, the career people there are wonderful people. I used to be one. Uh, I started, uh, you know, I was a career prosecutor for almost a decade. And so what we did and what we were able to accomplish, we focused heavily in the police area. Uh, that practice had been moribund under the um, Bush administration. We brought more pattern and practice cases. And these are the civil cases that enable us to go root and branch in a department and understand what's wrong. The prosecution in Minnesota of um, Mr. Chauvin is a very indispensable part of the pursuit of justice in Minnesota, but it's insufficient. What has to happen after that verdict is a top to bottom review of that department. The fact that Derek Chauvin had over two dozen uses of force and was still on the department tells me that that department has a fundamental failure of accountability. Early warning systems would have detected that, would have raised yellow flags. And so we worked really hard, Diana, across the country in places like Portland, in places like Seattle, in places like New Orleans, which maybe was the worst department I saw in my tenure. But we were, here's the good news. You can reform police departments. I am not an advocate of defunding the police. I'm an advocate of being smart. I was the guy who went after Joe Arpaio in uh, Maricopa County, Arizona. The, the remedy for Joe Arpaio's lawlessness was not defunding the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office. It was reforming it. And that's exactly what we did. And one of those reforms, the voters helped us. They threw them out of office as they should have. And we were able to turn things around there in a significant way. So I'm really proud of the work we did in the voting con in, in the um, uh, police context. We had an active voting docket. We settled the two largest uh, residential fair lending cases in the history of the Fair Housing Act. You know, in short, uh, Kristen's job is going to be very similar to what my job was when I got there because the Civil Rights Division has been closed for business over the last four years of the Trump administration. And she must restore the commitment to even handed, aggressive law enforcement. Here's why the Republicans oppose her she's going to enforce the law. They don't like that. And that's really what it is in a nutshell. I, I loved my time there. I spent over a decade of my life in the Civil Rights Division. Um, it's a crown jewel of the department and Kristen is going to lead it well. I think you're muted, Diana. Thanks. Um, so talk a little bit about the disproportionate impact, um, you did mention it, of COVID on women and on communities of color who were already at a disadvantage in terms of job wages, job security, um, health benefits, um, access to housing and social, social net um, safety net issues. And how could uh, a governor, for example, address that in the state of Maryland? Um, give us a little bit of your thoughts on that. Please. Yeah, no, I mean, the, the data is overwhelming. I mean, we had months where you look at the job loss and it was almost 100% women. I mean, I've never seen that in any month, any period of time where I was reviewing uh, job stuff. Uh, you have um, a situation where the communities that were most vulnerable were hardest hit by this pandemic, no doubt about it. Um, if you're Latino, you're, you're far more likely uh, to die if you get COVID. Same thing if you're African-American. Uh, you know, caregivers, disproportionately women, had to leave the workforce. And I think it's really important uh, you asked, like, what would a governor do? A governor ought to make sure that government works. Here in Maryland, people were waiting five months, five months to get an unemployment check. That's unconscionable because the department, I, I used to work there. We didn't have people waiting five months for an unemployment check. And you know what? The reason for that was because he, you know, this governor just doesn't sweat the details of governance. And the, the major challenge in the unemployment insurance context is a very fixable challenge. It's verifying identity. If you apply for um, uh, ACA insurance, they need to verify your identity, your immigration status, your um, income, all those things. And they do it and they do it very fast. But the state and the state of Maryland has all the data to fix the UI system, but they didn't do it. So what does a governor have to do? 
in the context of post pandemic. You've got to fix government and make sure it works. You've got to be honest about disparities. Look at infant mortality among um, African Americans in this state. It's unconscionable. I'm a firm believer that what you value, you measure, and what you measure, you value. We must continue to be measuring racial and ethnic disparities in a number of health outcomes and then develop a comprehensive plan for dealing with that. I used to serve on the Kaiser Commission on Medicaid and the uninsured, and we did a lot of work in this area. And a governor who pays attention to this will do something about this. We need to make sure that we address the abiding issue of our time, which is income inequality. And you saw that the, the folks in the shadows continue to be in the shadows. And, and, and we have an opportunity right now. And that's why I come to you with optimism. Despite this moment of uh, peril, I think we have an opportunity to transform Maryland. Look at this session. I mean, finally, we broke the dam, thanks to the Democrats on police reform. You know, that's been tried and tried and tried for a decade. I'm confident next year we'll make more progress on climate change. These are the moments, you know, I used to enforce labor laws at the labor department and civil rights laws. The laws I enforced at the labor department were largely a function of the new deal. The laws I enforced at the civil rights division were largely a function of the civil rights era of the sixties. Two remarkable eras, two tumultuous eras and out of which grew structural change that rewrote the social compact in America. I think we can do that now. And right. I think both the governor uh, and the president, and especially when the governor and the president get along, you can do so much for yeah. folks in so many areas. Yeah. You have had a lot of hats, haven't you? You've worked on a lot of these issues from different well, I'm angles. Bald, so I need a hat. <laughs> Um, here's one for you. The Washington Post this morning opined that the climate change mitigation steps in the infrastructure bill miss the mark and the best route is carbon tax, which would be more effective and obviate several other proposed components of the bill. You mentioned that the issue of our time is income inequality and that ties right into climate change since the income inequality exacerbates the impacts on those least able to handle them and those least in control of them. How would you, um, yeah. what do you think about the, the infrastructure bill in terms of climate change and whether it's the right approach or whether it should be a carbon tax? Well, I, th I think a lot of what's going to happen in the um, federal infrastructure bill addressing climate is it continues to be a work in progress. And, uh, you know, I, I've, I've spent a lot of time with uh, uh, Deb Holland, who's now the interior secretary, uh, you know, Jennifer Granholm. Uh, who's a classmate of mine uh, from school. I mean, the, the, the climate team, Gina McCarthy, uh, they are pros. And I am confident that they are going to continue reaching out to figure out uh, what the best solutions are. Uh, and, and I am equally confident that the infrastructure bill is going to be exceedingly aggressive in this area. And that's probably why one reason why you'll get very few Republican votes, because they don't believe in this. I'll yeah. tell you what we can do here in Maryland, Diana, and, 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 and it's not directly on point to this question. But uh, again, this is another example of an opportunity squandered uh, by this governor, and that's offshore wind. Mm -hmm. you know, Ten years ago, if you were having a conversation about offshore wind in the state of Maryland, in, in the mid-Atlantic, actually up and down the eastern seaboard, um, the state that was talking the most about it was actually Maryland, Martin O'Malley. He was talking about it and talking about the remarkable potential. And you know what happened? Larry Hogan got elected and he just didn't care. And now you know what's happened? We've gotten lapped by other states. Right. Massachusetts just got approval to build 4,000 megawatts of offshore wind, which will um, power hundreds of thousands of homes and businesses. New York has approval to do 9,000. New Jersey is 6,000. We're getting lapped by our neighbors to the south in um, Virginia. Rhode Island's kicking our butt. Rhode Island, you know, I mean, Montgomery County is about as big as Rhode Island. I love Rhode Island, don't get me wrong, but Rhode Island's kicking our butt. And here we are. We're, we're behind. Why is this so important? Because not only is it an environmental imperative, it's a tremendous opportunity for job creation. 
Offshore wind turbines are not manufactured in the United States. They're by and large manufactured in Europe. We can make them right here. We can use the Port of Baltimore. We can use our union labor to create great jobs. We can use apprenticeship programs to build the middle-class jobs of tomorrow. That's a huge conversation in the climate context. There's a real concern among a lot of folks and it's a legitimate concern. I know we have to clean our environment, but if you're telling me that I gotta leave one job that pays 30 bucks an hour for another job that pays 14 bucks an hour, that's not fair. And wind energy, offshore wind, we should be doing so much more. The Democratic legislature in Maryland has done a lot, but if you wanna succeed in offshore wind, the most important thing you need is sustained executive leadership. And Larry Hogan's been too concerned about Ocean City. Oh my God, I'm gonna have a bad view. Go to Block Island off of Rhode Island. People go, tourists go there to see the, the wind farm out there. We can do this. And this is another example of, of opportunity um, that is win, win, win. Win for workers, win for business, win for the environment. And I know you just uh, published an op-ed in the Baltimore Sun specifically right. on um, the win-win of, of wind. Um, <laughs> talk uh, a little bit about um, whether Republicans will ever regain, uh, I guess, their sanity or their moral compass and uh, how Joe Manchin plays into that. How do we work around him? How do we bring him on? It's just so much in the way of everything. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's that old adage, uh, everyone's entitled to their own opinion, but you're not entitled to your own set of facts. I think one of the scarier things about where we are right now is the um, entitlement that so many Republicans feel uh, to their own set of facts. The notion that you could have the hundreds and hundreds of voting voter suppression bills across the country that are all built on a foundation of fiction uh, is, is exceedingly troubling. And, and the root cause of this, Diana, or a root cause, in my opinion, is, again, gets back to HR1. You know, partisan and racial gerrymandering and dark money have so polluted our democracy. When you have a situation where, I mean, look at this. I think there's like two people in the Republican caucus of the U.S. House that have criticized Matt, Matt Gates. Like, hello, statutory rape. Like you, you, you can't call that out, that's unconscionable. And, and our politics right now, I talked to a bunch of my friends in the house, they're having trouble. They're, they were happy that uh, Congress went virtual for a while because in the aftermath of January 6th, where I had friends who were texting their children and telling them literally, I love you. I will always love you. They thought they were going to die, Diana. Uh, we're really in a hole here. And I don't have a lot of faith in Ronna Romney McDaniel. You know, we had to make tough calls um, in 2017, but, but we, weren't, we weren't climate deniers. We weren't, um, we were debating how to get to universal health care. We all had, we had differences of opinion, but we all knew what the North Star was. Uh, these folks, Trump still has a stranglehold on this party. And while he does, we're gonna continue to have challenges. And, and the thing to understand is, um, Trump turned out his folks, you know, I, we, we lost some elections that we should have won in 2020. And, and in part, that's because Trump really turned out his folks. And, and that's why the work of the Women's Democratic Club is so important. We must continue to be relentless now. I really yeah. think at some point we can regain our normalcy. I, I, I want a, a two-party system. Yes. I think it's better to have a functional two-party system. We don't have that a dance partner party. right now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, this is sort of a couple questions combined. S say something about uh, the District 1 race where um, at least Heather Mazur, I'm not sure if another um, candidate has declared for the Democratic nomination, is trying to unseat uh, that right winger, big lie supporter, um, Andy Harris. Um, and that's the last Republican in the Maryland state delegation. Maryland is not an all democratic state. Is it fair to gerrymander that seat? Is that who we wanna be? And um, if not, how do we create a Stacey Abrams style registration push to try to you know, really flip that seat legitimately? 
You know, I would, uh, you know, the, the partisan gerrymander case, uh, as you probably know, involved Wisconsin and Maryland. I wish that that case had come out the other way. Um, I, I think, um, it, I, as I said five minutes ago or 10 minutes ago, partisan and racial gerrymandering are a scourge on our democracy. And so I was rooting for a different outcome in that case, even if it had resulted in Maryland having maybe two competitive districts. Um, but you know, a thing I won't do is unilaterally disarm. Unfortunately, the Supreme Court, you know, they just washed their hands of this, said, no, oh, it's too hard. I disagree. Courts do hard things all the time, uh, but they didn't do it here. And, um, and as long as they're not going to do it, I don't believe in unilateral disarmament. Now, Andy Harris, I remember talking to some Republican, the happiest people in the state Senate of Maryland when Andy Harris left was the state Republican caucus uh, because they couldn't stand the guy. I remember uh, he was on the um, appropriations committee, subcommittee that I had to go before when I was labor secretary. And I remember talking to a few Republicans on that committee and they were basically telling me the same thing. And it's pretty remarkable. Um, it, I, I mean, he, I, I'd like to know how he got a medical degree because he's a science denier. Um, and, uh, and we have to work hard and we have fielded good candidates in the past and we've got to keep swinging the bat. Uh, and, and, and it's going to be difficult. There's no doubt about it, but, um, I applaud Heather and I, I think there may be someone else who's getting in. Uh, yeah. the race. I, I applaud them. Heather used to be my city council member yeah. in Tacoma Park. She lived a mile from me. Uh, yeah. So I appreciate that people are stepping up. We got to step up everywhere. Right, right. Um, here's one back to the Supreme Court. Um, regarding the uh, preclearance provisions and the fact that the Supreme Court removed them from the Voting Rights Act, uh, some have suggested the best way around that decision is to, is to apply preclearance to all 50 states. Uh, is that a possible solution? Is it practical? Could it pass? And if not, uh, what other options do you see on the table for that? I, I don't think that would uh, survive legal muster, and here's why. Um, you have to make specific factual findings in the record of discriminatory barriers and practices to justify the um, uh, extraordinary remedy of a preclearance requirement. I think we made a really compelling case. And, and, and here's one data point that just illustrates how bad our politics have become. When the Voting Rights Act was reauthorized in 2007, um, how many Republicans in the Senate voted against it? Zero. They all understood that this was a continuing pro problem. Uh, the person who led the charge in the House, and in 2007, um, the House was still under control of Republicans, was a guy named Jim Sensenbrenner, pretty conservative Republican who led the charge. And there were only a handful of House Republicans who voted against it. Look at where we are now. Um, we would, we, any, any law that gets passed in, in the voting contract is absolutely gonna go to the Supreme Court. And I think the key to success is going to be to be as surgical as possible in defining the states that are subject to preclearance and to make sure we have the detailed findings. Uh, I invite you to read the dissent of Ruth Bader Ginsburg in the um, Shelby County case in 2013. She, she just knocked it out of the park, not surprisingly. Uh, discrimination is over, uh, give me a break. And the proof is in the pudding. I think those, uh, those um, proposals from the various state legislatures were literally within the few days following that. Oh, absolutely. They, absolutely. They've been ready and waiting for their opportunity. Um, here's a different category. What is the best way to re-inject civic education? Um, and your thoughts, for example, on um, iCivics, which is an organization, a nonprofit started by former Supreme Court uh, Justice um, Sandra Day O'Connor, who of course was one of these swing votes in Bush v. Gore, which sort of cuts the other way. Um, and in terms of education and civics, um, one of the questions that came in was specific to paying teachers for 
what we ask them to do, which is to educate our future, mm -hmm. our, stu our students, our people, our citizens. You know, it's, 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 it, that question really illustrates that a, this is one area where I think across an ideological spectrum, there is an understanding that our failure to educate people about civic engagement has had real consequences. And we need to do it everywhere. And we need to do it, you know, in a, in a nonpartisan fashion. I think there's a way to do that. Um, and I, I, I had a number of conversations over the years with the, the late Justice O'Connor about that initiative. She was very proud of it. Uh, and I, I think what we're illustrating now, the, the, the level of, um, I think going back to civics is going to enable us to get back to um, a world in which we are grounded by facts as opposed to fiction. It is, it is just so troubling right now. Um, there's a basic proposition of law that says uh, findings of, uh, of a legislature when they are passing a law are entitled to, uh, findings of fact of a legislature when they're passing a law are entitled to deference by courts. You know, that's a really scary proposition right now, because in Georgia, those were not findings of fact. Those were findings of fiction that were used to justify uh, the voter suppression laws that were put in place. And I think when we uh, get down to basics, and, and this has to be something that's done at a local level, at a state level, and at a federal level, um, I think, I just think we have to commit ourselves as a nation. And the problem is, with the Republicans is that most of the folks who talk about this, they do it after they've left public office. Why do people become states people only after they uh, leave office? And why don't they have courage on the Republican side while they're in office? Uh, well, I guess it really, it, it, I feel like in the last 10 years or 15, I guess, um, I've seen it traced back to um, New Gingrich even. There was sort of a shift in gears that has accelerated, especially on the Republican side, that um, policy is important, but most important is getting reelected mm -hmm. and then twisting policy. Um, and I, I, it, it continues to elude me how um, a lot of Republicans who, as you say, how do these people get these degrees seem to understand seem to understand and yet carry on with yeah. um completely discriminatory and exclusionary policy it, it... i mean you know the i think one of the biggest mistakes we made on team obama with hindsight is we had a laudable but naive sense uh in 2009 that we could work together with the other side we should have taken Mitch McConnell at his word when he said, I wanted to be a one-term president. You know, we, we, I know Janet Napolitano was trying to do some stuff on immigration. And, you know, we thought, well, if we take actions um, that demonstrate our good faith, uh, they'll come together. That's just, there was no good faith. And we live in a world now where people, they just want to get reelected. We live in a world where members of the House don't know members of the House. They show up on a Monday night. They do a bed check vote. They are there till Thursday. They're most nights they're doing call time uh, and they're out of there Thursday and you don't know each other. You talk to members of Congress who were here in you know, a generation ago and you actually knew the other person's family and uh, it enabled you to see the humanity of your colleagues. You may see the world differently, but you had, an, uh, you had a vision. I, I worked for a guy named Ted Kennedy. He's my original mentor in politics. And you know he, he had genuine friendships with Orrin Hatch and others. And they got a lot of meaningful things done. That, and, and that just seems so improbable in today's world. And uh, yeah, I mean, I mean some, you asked before about Joe Manchin. Joe Manchin is one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful Senator in the Senate. And, um, and that's the world we live in. You know, my reaction to that is that's why I'm working my tail off uh, to make sure we have a plus two or plus three in the Senate. We have a good map for 22. We have an opportunity to win in Wisconsin, an opportunity to win in Pennsylvania, an opportunity for a flip in North Carolina. The 24 map is a little more challenging, but like we just got to elect more Democrats. Yes, so um, you must have these numbers at the top of your head. Um, 
in terms of running the national board, how many uh, seats are the Republicans defending at the Senate level versus uh, how many the Democrats are defending and how, how solid are they? Yeah, no, I mean, we've got real opportunity in 22. You, you, you have an open seat in Pennsylvania. You have an open seat in, uh, well, you have a, frankly, Ron Johnson in Wisconsin committed uh, to only running two terms. Right. I hope he breaks that commitment because I think he's the best candidate to run against uh, because he he's gotten, he is like, you know, he's like QAnon now. And um, we have an opportunity in North Carolina. Now we've got to defend um, Mark Kelly in um, Arizona because he's serving out a term. So he's up again in 22. We have um, Reverend Warnock right. uh, in Georgia. So we got to play some defense there. But there are other places as well. Um, you know, Missouri's now an open seat. And uh, depending on who gets nominated, there's one guy who might get nominated who um, uh, was actually, I, I don't know if he was convicted, but I mean, accused of like really serious stuff. But, you know, because they're gone so far right, we have opportunity. So, uh, you know, I think we've got to keep working on it and working on it everywhere. And, and the good news, I, I feel very good. You know, I mentioned that, you know, DNC was bankrupt when we got there. And, you know, now um, there's like $30 million uh, in the bank, you know, when I left. And, um, and Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, you know, I think we're, you know, we, unity is a timeless journey. We must always continue to work. But I think we're, I think we're better off now than we were four years ago. Uh, sure feels like we are. Um, so thank you for, for that. And then I guess the last question is, is a continuation of that theme. How do you see the primary process for president in 2024 being different, especially the sequence of states to minimize unequal caucusing? Yeah, I think you'll see less caucuses in 24. I think some states, there's only seven states that are caucus states. I think some of them are going to um, uh, go over to a primary. I, I, would, I would be stunned if Iowa goes first. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if um, the uh, first uh, set of votes is not just one state. It doesn't have to be one state. You could have a, an amalgam of uh, two or three representative states. You could put you could put uh, South Carolina and Nevada together, for instance, on the first day. That would be both demographically and geographically, or you could add a third state uh, to that. Uh, and have that together. Now, here's the rub on this though. Uh, if you make these changes, uh, some folks in these states that are um, not gonna be happy might insist on holding those caucuses early. And so what the De Democratic Party will need to do is make sure that they know if you do that, you will be sanctioned. And the sanction is simple. Your delegates won't count. Uh, that happened in 2008. Michigan jumped the queue. Florida jumped the queue. The DNC set a uh, precedent. They said, okay, it's not going to count. So, so they were calling your bluff. Uh, in 08, they were. They were yeah. calling your bluff. So, um, but we need to do this. You know, I mean, I'm sorry. I, you know, I don't mean to do any disrespect to Iowa, um, yeah. but it's, 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 it's time to change the process. Uh, you know, you might ask, well, why didn't you do it, Tom? And that's a fair question. Uh, and the answer is, we had so many other challenges to confront. We had a party that needed to come together. We needed to do the superdelegate reform. We needed to do uh, the primary and caucus reform. We were able to accomplish that. And at that point in time, those were the issues that were um, top of mind for everybody involved. Uh, and so, um, you know, this, that's what they have to do moving forward. I think they can do it, but it's not going to be easy because again, you know, people don't give up things, uh, easily. I have learned in life. Yeah, no power doesn't give up easily. Um, well, thank you, Tom. That was just tremendous. I'm getting a lot of, uh, direct messages saying nice things about you. Um, in addition to WDC, but especially about you and all the service you've given um, to the country. So welcome back to uh, oh, a little you. bit of quiet time. Um, and thank you very much for making time. Uh, you've given us lots to think about. I suspect um, we will be watching your next move. So well, thanks thank for joining you. us. And, and thank all you again for all you've done.
in TV land. Um, you can watch this, you can share this program with your buddies, or you can watch all of our previous, about the last year or so of um, Zoomed recorded um, programs with terrific speakers. And that's on our YouTube station, our YouTube channel. Um, so with that, please remember to sign up for our next WDC event, which will be Dr. Fiona Hill, um, bringing us her tremendous um, stories, I'm sure, and um, her thoughtfulness on uh, foreign policy in the US. That's in two weeks, April 29th, and that um, registration is open already. And then save the date, May 31st, Congressman Sarbanes to talk about the bill he's been championing for years, HR1, Senate 1, the For the People Act. Um, WDC and a lot of our sister organizations are working very hard to get people signed up to do phone banking into states where red senators are available, Republican senators are potentially gettable on voting for this um, in the Senate. It's obviously gotten out of the House and we're, we're facing a battle in the Senate. Um, thank you for helping WDC make a difference, all of you, and thank you for being part of the WDC community. I hope you will join or rejoin our WDC family and stay safe, stay engaged, and thank you all for joining us today. Look forward to seeing you at the next event.